Welcome everyone to another edition of Ozark's Voices, a production of Missouri State University Libraries. My name is Tom Peters. Today is Friday, July 11th, 2014. And our special guest today is Pete Hershen from Hershen Family Entertainment, um, perhaps best known as the uh, founders and creators of Silver Dollar City. Pete, welcome. Tom, thank you very much. It's, it's really, really good to be here. It's a beautiful day here. We're actually on the uh, campus, I guess you'd say, or in the park here at Silver Dollar City. It's a beautiful day. We call it the city. The city. Yeah. Yeah. Silver Dollar City. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got a tough question, probing question to ask you first right off. Where and when were you born? I was born in Chicago, Illinois, December 8, 1934. And if you're doing your math, that means that I'll be 80 years old this December. Congratulations. Save everybody a lot of grief. Congratulations. And did you grow up in Chicago? Was it Chicago proper or one of the... Well, uh, yes, no. Uh, I, uh, my first four and a half years were in Chicago. Um, uh, my mother and father, I lived there with my mother and father. My mother, uh, my mother, Guthrum, uh, Danish name, uh, was, uh, she died when I was three years old. And so uh, the sequence after that was uh, Hugo, my father, uh, married Jack, my brother, Jack's mother. They, she and her husband were divorced. And odd piece of history as, as things worked out. My mother and Gudrun and Mary, my stepmother, I call her mother, uh, knew each other before I was born. They had worked together. They were. I have a picture of both of them uh, before uh, I existed, or before my brother existed. Uh, it's just. Well, that's amazing. One of those coincidences of, of history. Yeah. Um, and so, um, giving you too long an answer to your question, then we we moved then just north of Chicago to a suburban town called Wilmette. Wilmette. Uh, Chicago, Evanston, Wilmette, as we progress up uh, north uh, along Lake Michigan. Okay. Went to high school there? High school there. Yeah. New Career High School. Uh, again, both my brother and myself. And uh, first two years at Northwestern University. Uh, and then ultimately I graduated at the University of Missouri. Okay. So when did you first come down to the Ozarks? Well, came down as a kid uh -huh. uh, with mom and dad. Uh, they. Uh, Mom and Dad had uh, come to the Ozarks in the after World War II. Uh, they'd come down here. Uh, Jack and I always agreed that they really were trying to escape their two teenage boys uh, for a little while. So uh, probably with good reason. One one time while they were gone, we painted the house. So we didn't tell them. We just painted the house. They probably had to have some cleanup work done on the windows <laughs> afterwards. But anyway, we did. Uh -huh. um, they came down to the Ozarks um, on vacation, uh, getaway. Actually, the first place in Missouri they came was to Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, the name, of, of the lake being well named, uh, you would rather naturally think that that's the epicenter of the Ozarks. And uh, it was certainly the commercial, tourism commercial at the center at that time uh, in the years post-World War II. Uh, and for many years that followed, Lake of the Ozarks was much, much busier tourist area uh, than we are now here today. Uh, but they didn't, it wasn't what they were looking for, because they were looking for uh, a little more space, a little more countryside, um, Dad, uh, in particular, uh, was an ornithologist. He loved birds. He loved, loved birds. I am genetically predisposed to do the same thing. I feed all manner of birds. Uh, wild birds, not, not cage birds. Um, and he loved wildflowers. Well, the Ozarks, our, these Ozarks in uh, the late 1940s, were unspoiled. There was, there was very little visitor traffic, and there were fields of wildflowers. 
they were probably full of seed kits too, but that's, uh, you know, he probably didn't love the seed kits. Uh, but, but they fell in love with the Ozarks. Uh, the, the beauty and the serenity of the Ozarks. Uh, so that was in the 47, 48, 49 time frame. In 48 and 9, uh, Hugo and Mary, mom and dad, uh, quite literally discovered uh, not Marble Cave, it had been commercialized a long time. That's another another question, another story, I know. Yeah. Um, but they discovered Miriam and Genevieve Lynch. And here were two of the most interesting uh, people you would ever hope to meet. Uh, Miss Miriam was 75, Miss Genevieve was 73. They ran Marble Cave as a tourist attraction. They had inherited from their father, and if you want, we can go into that story uh, later. But Tom, um, Miss Miriam, took care of all the books. She ran the business side. And Miss Genevieve, 73 years old, would take four tours a day through Marble Cave. Now, you say, oh, well, that's okay. Uh, that was 50 stories down, and then 50 stories back up because the train didn't exist. And you do that 73-year-old woman doing that four times a day. She was a remarkable lady. She was an RN, had been a practicing nurse all her life. Uh, Miss Miriam was a trained opera singer. Lived for an entire year in a convent in, in Canada that they spoke only French because she wanted to perfect her French for the operatic roles. Uh, that, and, and when I say old maids, uh, that's not a put down. They were never married. They were sisters. They lived together and had a very comfortable, very good life. Uh, lived in a cabin not, not far from where we sit right now. So back in that era, how did you get down into the cave? Was it a series of... Lines? Carefully. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you look at the pictures taken from the 1950s uh, and 1940s uh, in in the cathedral room, you look back up and you will see there is a tall, looks like a fire tower. Like uh, the forestry department had built a fire tower only, <clears throat> built it out of wood and put it inside the cave. And that's, you came down the entrance to the cave is a sinkhole that it collapsed. That's what makes the mountain inside the cave. And then uh, the the men who worked for Miss Marion and Miss Genevieve, and that's what you always called them. It wasn't a you or Genevieve, it was Miss Marion and Miss Genevieve. Uh, built, that's really the best description, built this Think of a forestry fire tower out of wood, big, big beams on four corners, and then built zigzag stairs uh, down inside. And that, that worked, it really worked well. Um, that's what it was when uh, Hugo and Mary leased the cave from Miss Mary and Miss Genevieve, beginning uh, May 15th of. Our start date. 1950. Yeah. 15. So what was there? What was Hugo and Mary's idea? Were they going to was this a potential sort of retirement? Uh, something they wanted to do to remain active? Or it it was all of that, Tom. Uh, it was Dad was a, uh, a direct a sales manager, not director, sales manager for the Electrolux Corporation. Electrolux then was exclusively vacuum. That's, and and door-to-door -door selling, a form of selling that doesn't exist today, uh, or at least I wouldn't want to try it. Uh, but uh, he was very successful at doing that. Always, his his division, the Evanston division, was always in the neighborhood where they had contests and, and so on. So it worked 
very, very well. Dad uh, was in his 50s. He was, whatever year it was, that's how old he was born. He was born in 1899, so easy to keep track of how old he was. <coughs> he was uh, in, in the 50s, I think, considering what else he wanted to do. And uh, he and Mary found that they really loved these Ozarks. So uh, it was going to be a business, but also a retirement business. Uh, that was the original thinking. It didn't work out that way. Uh, but that's, that's what was behind their thinking of doing this. It was going to be something they could do together, uh, run the game. There was never, ever, at that point, a dream of what Silver Dollar City could. There wasn't a Silver Dollar City. So you were a teenager back then when this <coughs> was all happening. So what did, what did you think? What, do you remember your first trip down here? And, Absolutely. And what, what were your thoughts? And before you get down here, did you travel Route 66 at all when you came down? From so the only way you came down. Do you have any members or memories of Route 66 on uh, those trips? The, I have memories of Route 66 were uh, uh, that we always thought was pretty pretty marvelous. That there was a highway, two lane highway, except south of St. Louis. And south of St. Louis, the the then highway department had done something very, very innovative, which killed a lot of people. They, they made a passing lane, but just one. So if you're going south and you wanted to pass a car, you pulled into that middle lane. If you're going north and wanted to pass a car, you pulled into the same middle lane. Um, not a healthy environment. And I remember, uh, not a happy memory, but I, but I absolutely remember that uh, and there, were, there were some tragedies along there. And the funny, funny thing, the highway departments then were doing, I, I suspect there was some sort of logic. Instead of ditches and the water running off to the side, they put a slight curve so all the water that fell on the road stayed in the roadway. It was, you know, you could go swimming at some point. Now, obviously, it would run off when you up, up and down. Uh, but I have no idea. Uh, but Highway 66, I remember clearly coming into Springfield. Uh, I remember uh, uh, the, uh, the Railhaven Motel. Uh, the highway would turn there and drive right straight through town. Uh, come out on, on the other side, uh, it, uh, it yeah, I have a lot of memories, yeah. good memories. Did it seem exciting to be traveling on Route 66? Do you think you were on a, an important road? No. It was just it, a highway. It was the highway. Uh, highway uh, because uh, I would uh, answer that by, does it seem exciting to travel on Interstate 44 today? And the answer is, it was the state of the art, but it was also what we accepted as being a uh, modern highway system. So any more than you think about, uh, something has to be pretty phenomenal on the interstate system uh, before you start noticing, well, like uh, I-270, uh, the circumferential around St. Louis, uh, eight and some places 10 lanes. Well, no, I take notice of that. Uh, but uh, 65, I have more romance in history today because of its significance uh, than uh, we did at the time. It was a means to an end. So what were your first impressions when you got down here? What, what, you know, you were a teenager and from Chicago, and what did you think? Jack and I were the only guys at New Trier High School whose parents had a cane. That was, we said that, and and the kids would look at us and say, uh-huh, okay. <laughs> and they, it didn't, came, because came, there are no caves. Well, that's not quite true, but essentially there are no caves in, in the state of Illinois, and it's a 
rock solid guarantee that people who went to New Trier High School didn't care a rip about caves. Uh, so we were, in fact, the only kids at New Trier High School whose parents had a cave. Uh, and uh, I, now, now I see the, the, the kids I went to school with. They're not quite kids anymore, but the ones that I see them from time to time. And they say, we always remember you talking about having a cave and we thought you were nuts. Um, and now they come down here and they can see, well, you, know, you may have been nuts, but uh, it was good kind of nuts. That's right. Um, I was 14, Jack was 16. Uh, and for two kids from the city, they're city boys, or suburban boys, uh, the idea, it was like a Boy Scout camp out that just went on for days and days and days at a time. Um, you need to remember uh, what the Ozarks, where we sit right now, uh, there was exactly nothing here. Uh, this was woods. Uh, there was no pathway. There was no building. Uh, there were no visitors. The parking lot for Marble Cave, that is to say, where everybody came, was in the village. What is now the Village Square? Uh, your your audiences will be familiar with that. Uh, and the square was half the size of what you see up there uh, now. Uh, and it, it held all of our business too, and all of our employee cards. And that would have been six or so cars, uh, but for a 14-year-old, 16-year-old, this was a wonderful adventure. Uh, we came down, <laughs> Mom, Mary, uh, when uh, the way it evolved, she was going to be the one coming down in the summertime, uh, spending four, uh, five months uh, a year down here. And she insisted to Dad that we have indoor plumbing because there was none. There was none. We had the first indoor plumbing in the southern half of Stone County in 1950. And the reason that that is a fact is, uh, I'm talking about in out in the country, in the city, say, obviously. Uh, Electricity had only arrived right where we sit right now in 1948. Well, it's hard to have indoor plumbing. Sounds nuts. You've got to have electricity because you've got to have something to run the pump to put water pressure in. Uh, so, so it's only two years since electricity had come to the air. That's right. And so the houses that were wired were wired on the inside wall. Here's Here's the house, and here's the wall. The wires were run here. There were insulated wires, uh, but you can just go around the edge of the room. And if you wanted to attach, if you wanted a lamp to, so you, you could read your book, uh, it's called Romex wire. I remember it, you used it a lot. You just scrape the insulation off, attach what's called a pigtail to it, insulate that, then do the same thing on the other wire, and now you had a plug-in, and you could put an extension cord up into for a lamp, and you could read your book. Probably not up to today's code, I guess. Uh, code would not quite pass that, uh, but then there was no code, so it was simple. So you had a great time, spent your summers down here basically during throughout your uh, teenage yeah, years. Yeah. And uh, did you work in, you all worked the cave? What did all you worked do? in the cave. What did you do? Did you all divide it up? Were you uh, well, uh, everybody did one of everything. Uh, and, and we did work. It wasn't just all play. It wasn't Jack and Pete coming down here to have a good time and everybody else working. Uh, first of all, you need to remember if there was no electricity, until 1948 here, there was no electricity in Marble Cave. So when we would take a tour in that first year, that uh, that I I was a guide in 1950, we take Coleman lanterns, and they were gas-fired Coleman lanterns, and every third person in the 
tour would carry a letter with them. Uh, and it was spooky. It was a spooky tour. It was, it was, it was I believe, the, much more romantic in terms of exciting than what we do uh, today. Could we do today what we did then? The answer is not even uh, close. Couldn't handle the crowd. It wasn't nearly as safe. And, and everybody carrying a gas-filled lantern is ultimately a, a design for an accident to happen. So uh, we would guide. Uh, sometimes uh, we take uh, four and five trips a day to the cave, just like Miss Genevieve did. We go down to the waterfall, and turn around, walk back up. Were the caves like, you know, 10, noon, 2, 4, or did you no, just, whenever, whenever, you you got, up. whenever you got a crowd? As, as, soon as, as soon as you showed up, uh, you started a tour, and then we would stall as long as we could to see if there were, perhaps another car would, would uh, drive in. So instead of two people, we could have four on the tour. And that first year, 1950, uh, we had record attendance in Marble Bay. Uh, they had never before in a year with 5,000 guests to go through the cave. And we did it that, that was the first year. It's about 1,000 a month, about five months. Give or take, there, yeah. give or take. It would be a little, little more in, in July, a little less in, in the shoulder uh, seasons. Uh, but uh, 1,000 1, people a month uh, will do 1,000 a day now. Uh, there, there is no... Uh, logistic comparison to how things were then and now, uh, but it was it was it was fascinating and and the start of progress through the cave that we we'll probably talk about that in a little bit. Um, you asked what we did, and that I wanted to answer that. Jack, my brother, uh, became very adept at painting highway signs. We, would, we owned all our own highway signs, and uh, highway signs then and highway signs now are uh, uh, Model T Fords and uh, Jet Airliners uh, by way of comparison. So we would, we would paint them, build them, and paint them, and put them up. Uh, that was one of the reasons we were able to get 5,000. Uh, one of my jobs when I wasn't guiding was to distribute literature. Um, today, everybody and their grandmother has a brochure and there are racks uh, you know, that are six and eight feet wide full of, full of brochures, and that's okay. Uh, in 1950, there were this many. We were the first ones to have a brochure of any kind. And uh, uh, we made it a map. It was a map of the area, coincidentally with pictures of Marble Cave uh, on the side. And we would take that, was, it was my job, to make three or four cases of maps. And uh, I would do this about two days a week. Uh, load them in the back of my car and I would go uh, motel by motel in Branson. And uh, you get to know the people there them a supply and answer their questions and in general try to make a good impression. And uh, then uh, that was 1915, 1951 we expanded out a little bit uh, from that. And by 1952, 1953 we were taking brochures, a little more sophisticated brochure, Eureka Springs, Springfield, uh, we go a little way up and down uh, Mother Road, Highway 66. Um, not too far, uh, because the number of people traveling on Highway 66 who were going to be induced to turn off and come down uh, a very curvy Highway 65 uh, to a town they've never heard of, Branson, uh, was going to be a very, very small. So I was wondering that. So your 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 sixty six didn't really drive those five thousand people coming down. They were here. Yeah. They were here. You, you need to remember that Branson has a long, long history uh, in 
uh, travel, not as a travel destination the way it is today. Um, coming back to William Henry Lynch, the founder of Mary McGenerys, uh, Miss Mary McGenerys' uh, father, 1894. I know you jacked up with that. He, he does that far better than I do. But 1894, 1894. Hey, that's our hundred. 20 years ago this year, um, he was in the tourist business. Now, very, very small numbers. Uh, then the railroad came through. Then Harold Bell Wright wrote uh, Shepherd Hill. This is all in the uh, less than 1920 and before. And then Lake Tiny Como uh, was built first man-made dam west of the Mississippi in America. Uh, it doesn't look like much of a structure right now in terms of big and broad. Uh, when you consider, you look at the history of the construction of that, of that dam, it was built in large measure with mules pulling what are called skip shovels. Uh, and real steam shovels were used. I mean, when I talk about this, they had a boiler on, and what ran the doggone digging stuff was steam, steam powered. You know, and they floated all the material until, uh, until 10 years ago, there was a siding in Branson off of the railroad track that was, uh, and a crane still was there. It all came down when they built the, uh, the landing. But there was a crane there that they offloaded the rail cars onto barges so they could float the material. That's how they got it. That's how they got it. everything down the river. Yeah. Down to where the dam was. So that that changed that changed the, the travel industry here. It started to become a destination. Names like Jim Owen. I had the privilege of knowing Jim. And he was a promoter promoter. The guy was amazing. And to, to look at him, he couldn't find his way out of a wet paper bag. Uh, uh, not true. He was brilliant. He only managed to make the cover of Life magazine three times. Three times in his history here in France, uh, always something about floating, always something about, uh, about the air. Uh, so the, the, uh, the book Shepherd Hill absolutely changed uh, this, this area. So you think of those 5,000 people in 1950 that went down, down in Marble Cave, were they here primarily to see Shepherd of the Hills country, or were they here? No, the book, yeah, they were that. And there for the band. outdoors, um, float trips and hunting. Uh, and Rockaway fishing. Beach was uh, much, much more of a tourist destination than the Branson ever thought about that. Branson was a wide spot in the road. Uh, kind of had stoplight. That was about it. A few resorts. Uh, Sammy Lane Resort, Anchor Village. Uh, there are probably half a dozen resorts. Maybe a couple more. In, uh, in Branson at the time. Rockaway Beach is where, if you were going to come to the Ozone Center, uh, and that's where, that's where Hugo and Mary came. They came and stayed at the old Hotel Rockaway, which has been burned down since uh, the foundation was built. But the, uh, they, they operated on Rockaway Beach, they didn't operate on Branson. Because that's well, there were a few places. So, uh, at some point, you all realized that you weren't operating a cave attraction, but you were, the, the activity on the surface supplanted the activity underground in terms of interest, and uh, how did that all come about? Well, uh, pretty much that way. Um, Dad died in 1955, he, but he was the first one to 
to give voice. And I can remember uh, the, the statement. He said, I think that our visitors would really like to see, uh, he used the word hillbilly, but never as a pejorative. Uh, but the, the natives of the hills, his statement was, I think, I think that they would really like to see the men and women, how they made their living, how they, how they lived. Uh, it's very much of a bartering side. If I made split rails um, and you made fly soap, uh, we're going to do a trade. Let's talk. Uh, if I was, if I had a kid who was good on pottery and could make plates, uh, I might like one of your hogs. Uh, uh, perfectly honest, absolutely honest and honorable uh, way uh, to live. Dad had that vision before he before he died in 55. He did not describe silver dollar That would have he wasn't even attempting to do that. What he was trying to do was put words to a dream. Um, that was just one of the one of the regrets in my life was that he wasn't able to uh, live so he you know, 114 years old, and I'm talking about how she was alive today, and he's in heaven. I know he's, you know, enjoying all that we're, uh, that we're doing, uh, but uh, he had the first vision. Well, when Dad died in 55, that, uh, here's the principal in the family, the breadwinner, uh, and we were still legally resident in Illinois. Was there kind of a crisis then in terms of, Absolutely. well, we're going to continue on or we're going to... Yeah. yeah, we had to make, it was Mary and her her two boys. Uh, Jack is now in, in 55, Jack is 23 years old, and uh, I turned 21 that year. Uh, he died in November, I, I turned 21 that December. Um, but we were still legally resident here in Illinois. We were here in Missouri operating a business. And then Dad died, uh, so the decision had to be made, and uh, uh, Mary was uh, not not a corporate executive. And any any anybody who tells you that she was a brilliant executive would be wrong. And she was told you she was not an executive, and she was there with two two boys who were still pretty wet behind the ears. Um, where that impression came from. thought about that one. Um, I'm a reference librarian. I'll, I'll research and get back okay, to you. Okay, come back to me. And work on dead as a doornail at the same okay. time. <laughs> uh, never figured that one out. Um, uh, so the decision was made. And we all three made it, but she was in charge. She's the matriarch at this point. That we would sell our home in Illinois and move to Missouri. That's exactly what we did. We uh, became legal residents of, of Missouri. Did she, did she discuss it with you boys? Or did she, we talked to, was we, she anguished yeah. over this decision? Or was it just seemed to be it, 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 it was, it was, there was anguish. But it was anguish in leaving a way of life. Not anguish over where, where to go because we ran out of options. Um, the, we were not a wealthy family. Uh, Middle America, yes, well not Illinois is a, uh, today would be considered much more of a wealthy suburb than it was then where we lived was a comfortable living, as uh, uh, Mary was fond of saying, they actually had paved streets and telephones and fire departments and police and garbage and uh, milkmen who brought milk. And Indoor plumbing. Indoor plumbing, <laughs> and none of that, and neighbors who spoke to you. Uh, and none of that uh, was here. So there was anguish in leaving a dependable way of life. But you know, that's that's not an unusual ang anguish. Uh, many families that are, uh, where the breadwinner dies early, uh, are, are faced with parallel decisions, whether they mean moving from Illinois to Missouri, 
hurry or just simply moving to another place. No, it's, it's immaterial. Those are always hard. But that decision was made. We did come down here and establish residence. Now, your question was how, how did Silver Dollar City evolve out of all, all that? The first uh, four years after Dad died were difficult years. We were just running Marvel Cave. The business was getting better in Marvel Cave. Uh, we, we had gone uh, in 19, uh, 1958. Uh, installed, and when I say we, I mean it wouldn't have happened without my brother, uh, all credit to him, uh, we installed the cable train to bring you back up on the model cable. That changed the cave business remarkably, because now it was no longer a 55-story climb back up. It was, uh, it's still got some climbing, but maybe, maybe, 50, 60 feet vertical uh, climb down here, right out. Uh, so in 1959, there were 80,000 visitors to Marble Cave. That's Still primarily a summertime attraction? Or uh, primarily. Uh, come Labor Day, uh, we do, we, we actually, uh, on Labor Day Monday afternoon, we would do a staff picnic right up there on the, what is now the village square because there were no customers. And Labor Day, it was it was over, and it would start Memorial Day to Labor Day. That was really it. In 1959, uh, late su late summer, uh, into our life walked a a man named Russ Pearson, Russell Pearson and changed our lives forever and changed the lives of thousands of men and women who worked for the company. And when you say walked in, he literally walked in. You literally had no contact walked in. with him before? He, we'd just... never met him before. Um, wish I had a picture of him here. He walked in. I had him in my head. He's wearing a uh, uh, Stetson. He, is, he wasn't wearing a six gun, but he could have because he's in boots and he's dressed out like a well-dressed cowboy. You'd have thought the guy was a, a, a nutcase or something. Uh, big mustache, delightful personality. I will tell you, uh, he made a remarkable change in all of our lives. Not just in our Jackson people, but in we have 10,000 people who work in this company now. And they were all touched by that one life. Because what he proposed was the genesis of Silver Dollar City. And he said it this way, and, and, and he, what he said was right and made sense. He said, look, what you have, just talking to us, what you have here, Marvel Cave, is a, is a good attraction. What you ought to build over there, and he pointed to the other side of the parking lot, is an Ozark town, and this will give people something to be interesting because there will be a jail in it, and there will be a blacksmith shop, and a general, and a general store, uh, and, and uh, uh, a few other buildings like that, who the people will enjoy coming to, and it will be something that they can they can do. You want to you want to come. So into our life walks a guy named Russ Pearson. And Russ, to look at him then, my, my kind of mental picture of him, he, he looked like every man's version of a, of a well-dressed cowboy. Stetson, mustache, boots, vest, you should watch a chain. It, uh, you might have thought he was a bit of a nutcase, he was not. He was just a genuine guy. He, interestingly enough, he was a designer of park. Uh, he had a carnival background. He was good at drawing. He had he had designed another park in Oklahoma City. Um, Frontier City. Frontier City was his the first one. When I say design, he didn't. He wasn't an architect. 
and he had no no equity in it. He just found some people who had a small property over there, and he said, "What you ought to do is build what became Frontier City," uh, and they built it. And so he walks into our life in that uh, summer afternoon. Well, it wasn't just one summer afternoon. He was there went on for quite a while. Uh, but he said, you have a good attraction here, Marble Cave. But all we had was Marble Cave. There was nothing, nothing else. And he said, you need to build something over there, meaning the other side of the parking lot, that would give visitors to the cave something to do before they went into the cave or after they came out. And he said, here's what it could look like. And he sketched it out. And um, okay, that, you know, there's merit in, in what you're saying. It makes some degree of sense. So uh, carry it on a little further. The first blueprint of, Mar of Silver Dollar City was a scale model that he built. There are no blueprints of the original Silver Dollar City. None. None existed then uh, or today. Much to the dismay of our maintenance and construction people, they, they keep finding wires. Or where'd that wire come from? <laughs> but uh, it and and the original model went from uh, the uh, the log cabin we're sitting right right beside uh, Wilderness Church, and then the front street uh, the general stores that are now over to the blacksmith shop, and that was it. It had one attraction in it called Slant and Sam's Old Miner Shack, uh, which you paid 25 cents uh, to go through. Grandfather's Mansion is a duplicate of Slant and Sam's uh, now. It was just a tilt tilt house that uh, you, know, you just lose your horizon. Uh, that's good. That's a good piece of uh, And so in the winter, the fall and winter of 59, going into uh, we built, and I want to be very clear, we uh, was led by my brother. I was uh, finishing up my military service then. I was in Greenland, as a matter of fact. Uh, not a place to go on the don't do that. Uh, and so uh, my brother, now I came back in on some of the construction, uh, but basically Jack gets the credit for being the director of construction for that first part of uh, Silver Dollar City. And by the way, it wasn't called Silver Dollar City. What, did it, what was the name Silver Dollar City? Well, I'll, I'll okay. tell you that. Um, but we didn't even have a name for it. It was just the village. Uh, and uh, we that was, a, there was some fussing back and forth inside the family on that as to what do we call it. Um, that's one I won uh, because Jack wanted to call it Ozark Mountain Village which it was, but as I said to uh, Jack, that's, that's a set of, of, of pronouns, uh, not proper nouns. Uh, those are adjectives. They describe a place, but it's, it's like describing Tom as six feet tall with uh, brown brown hair, but it doesn't describe, it doesn't say who Tom is. No, i got to have Tom. Oh, oh, okay. So we end up naming it Silver Dollar City. How do we name it Silver Dollar City? Um, our, the, the guy, we had, a, we had a staff of four people. Uh, one of those four was a guy named Don Richardson, who was really, really part-time with us because he worked, uh, he was PR for the Ozark Jubilee uh, in Springfield, and that's another whole story. Uh, Don was part of this discussion back in the back and forth. What do, we, what do we call it? And uh, it was Don who came up with the name. Because Don said, okay, what we'll do is we'll call it Silver Dollar City. And then everybody who comes to Silver Dollar City will get a silver dollar in change. They buy a dollar's worth of something to pay for it with a five dollar bill, they, they'll get a silver dollar. And Don was right, because the effect that that had was people would go, then go back into town, wherever they were going, 
and they pay for the gas with the silver dollar. You get three gallons then for a dollar. Uh, they uh, they they uh, or go to dinner or what have you, and uh, they would say one of two things. They'd say, Ah, well, you were out at that silver dollar city place, right? Yeah, and you know, then there's discussion. Or where'd you get the silver dollar? And we were out at that silver dollar city place. And considering that we had a marketing budget that was almost a negative number, we just didn't have any money. Uh, again, we put all of uh, the maximum we could borrow at, uh, at the time was $35,000. Borrowed $35,000 to build the original silver dollar city. From a local bank? Or? From a local bank. Yeah. And that, by the way, has been a good return on investment, I just thought, <laughs> for, the, for the record. Um, yeah, and it was a generous loan, and the and the banker Ben Parnell, marvelous, marvelous guy. Uh, his uh, his son uh, uh, was Todd Parnell, uh, president of Drury, and uh, you know and Parnells have a long, long, excellent history. But Ben would loan us money every summer, operating capital, and the FDIC would come in every year and say, Where, where's this, what's the collateral? And say, well, they have a cave. <laughs> and, and FDIC would say, how do we pull them? And Ben said, don't worry, they'll pay me back. And of course, we always did. It was really, really paid back by the middle of July. But it, it, the, the marketing budget, which didn't exist, was now able to create word of mouth. And that was the that was the gem of the name. Is the name a good name? Today, it's a good name. Then I would argue, in the early history, the early ten years, we always started a conversation with explaining what Silver Dollar City was or was not, because the first assumption you would make, Tom, was, oh, it's like Blue Hill uh, out in uh, Kansas where Western Shootabouts. And we'd say, well, no, and we'd have to explain what it wasn't as opposed to explaining what it was. That's immaterial today because people know it as Silver Dollar City, and that's fine. It has come to stand for uh, the home of American craftsmen. It has come to stand for family entertainment. It has come to stand for whatever. But that, that those early years started just that way. Just the main street. We did shows. Russ Pearson said, oh, we have to do some shows. And so we did the Hatfields and McCoy. Beautiful. This was before the big Branson boom. This was before the Branson boom. That's how, how has that affected Silver Dollar City overall in the last Oh, marvelous. It was marvelous. The Branson boom, which came first, the chicken or the egg, uh, we, were, we, Silver Dollar City, were certainly part of that boom. Because without Silver Dollar City having been here, uh, the music industry, which got the spotlight on the boom appropriately, uh, wouldn't have wouldn't have had the base to grow from. We, we were the linchpin of drawing uh, tourists. Still are the, the largest runway, the largest uh, attraction in the area. And you know, thank God, uh, I'm grateful for every one of them. But the show industry, which is the uh, second of three legs that this area uh, stands on, the show industry wouldn't have had the base of Silver Dollar City visitors to go on for their shows at night. Does that mean that shows wouldn't have succeeded? They would have, but it would have been on a smaller basis. I, I give you a Lake of the Ozarks uh, has a few shows, but I think it's three that have been successful over time. Uh, Branson today has 20 operating theaters, uh, 25, uh, I don't know what the number is, but the entertainment industry has critical mass here. Uh, it's there, by the way, the Ball Robbers, the Maid family, started here, their first public appearance was here at opening of Silver Dollar City in May of 1960. 
We're about out of time. I have one final question. Going back to that, the 50s, late 50s, uh, Ozark's Jubilee, Ozark Jubilee was uh, huge. Very popular. Very popular, 9 million viewers nationwide. As it wound up its run in the late 50s, was that talent coming down here looking for work, that production talent, that musical talent? Uh, you mentioned the PR and marketing folks. Um, did, did that help you at all? Did you, was that? Uh, no, I would say no. Uh, no direct impact. There wasn't a transfer of talent because remember the music industry hadn't started yet in Branson and uh, uh, in the late uh, late 50s Ozark Jubilee was wrapping up uh, and the music industry hadn't, hadn't launched and not in, in any scope. Uh, the Bald Knobbers and the Presleys uh, and, and Foggy River Boys start, got their start in the early 60s, uh, but none, neither of those, none of those shows uh, used talent from the uh, There was, uh, I mentioned Don Richardson, who was publicist for the Jubilee, and he became our, the, our director of public relations here, very important talent. Um, one of the most important designers for Silk College gentleman named Andy Miller. Andy Miller was set designer for the Jubilee. Worked out of a little tiny office in Springfield on uh, Olive Street. Um, and uh, when the Jubilee uh, wrapped up, we, we ended up using so much of Andy's time that he just moved down here. And uh, I have I have a book in my possession uh, of sketches that he made up uh, as a birthday present for uh, Mary of all of the uh, early buildings uh, here. His hand, the look of this place where we sit right now, right here, right now, is Andy Miller. The look of not how it, exactly how it uh, But he, he had a huge impact, Don Richardson had a huge impact. And I do believe that the Ozark Jubilee had a meaningful impact too uh, because it put Springfield, Missouri on the map. Uh, that uh, made a difference when you're when you're talking about where where are the Ozarks. You could easily say, well we're just south of Springfield, Missouri. Oh, I got it. I know where you are. Uh, without that, uh, and I don't think Springfield, Missouri would have had that notoriety. Well, someone told me yesterday, they'd heard, where's Springfield? Well, it's just north of Branson. Well, <laughs> you, we, we get some of that. Uh, yeah. So it's got to go from uh, Well, Pete, I want to thank you very much. I know you've got a uh, busy schedule today. We've been speaking with Pete Hershen from Hershen Family Entertainment, uh, best known as the developers of Silver Dollar City. Near Brands, West Tom, Brands. thank you very much. It's an honor to have all of you here, and I wish you the best of luck on, on this archive project. It's marvelous. Thank you very much.